الجاهزية للطوارئ الصحية مو بس مسؤولية القطاع الصحي ناخذ مثلا زيادة الوزن والسمنة صح إنه مرض صحي لكن معالجتها مسؤولية اجتماعية تستدعي تبني منهجية متعددة الجوانب As both a sports medicine and family medicine physician, I've witnessed firsthand how lifestyle choices, especially physical activity and nutrition, directly influence overall health and the prevention of chronic disease. In the UAE, where we see a rise in conditions like diabetes and hypertension, small incremental changes such as reducing sugary drinks or increasing physical activity like walking or swimming can make a profound difference in reducing these chronic disease risks. Life can and will be stressful. Learning to navigate challenges without losing composure is a critical life skill that we can all strategically cultivate. أصبحت الأدوات والتمارين الرقمية للصحة النفسية ذات أهمية متزايدة في تعزيز المرونة والتعامل مع الأجهاد خاصة في مواجهة ضغوط عالمنا المعاصر من خلال دمج التمارين في الروتين اليومي يصبح للأفراد قدرة على بناء خطط للتأقلم مع الضغوطات مما يعزز المرونة والقوة النفسية مع مرور الوقت وتقدم تمارين وقائية مثل تقنيات التنفس وتتبع الحالة المزاجية وروتين الاسترخاء One of our most popular mental health and well-being initiatives invites all first-year students to attend a special event shortly after they arrive. We present a musical performance crafted by upper-class students where they use sketch comedy and dance and drama to illustrate the various experiences students might face at university and the support resources available to them. This really engaging and thoughtful performance not only normalizes the challenges students encounter, but it also reinforces the messages that seeking help is a sign of strength. أثبتت الدراسات والأبحاث العالمية أن لكل دولار واحد ينفق على الوقاية هناك عائد يعادل أربع دولارات لأن الاستثمار في الرعاية الصحية هو استثمار في مستقبل أفضل في الواقع لما يتدخل القطاع الصحي إحنا تأخرنا لأننا قاعدين نعالج مرض قائم بدال ما نحط جهودنا اتجاه الوقاية من هذا المرض تركيزنا في القطاع الصحي هو التنبؤ بالأمراض والتصدي لها وأتمتة عمليات الرعاية الصحية والوقائية من المرض لأن الوقاية خير من العلاج ولأن إذا كان عندنا أفراد يعون مسؤوليتهم الصحية راح يكون عندنا بالتأكيد مجتمع صحي ووقاية أفضل بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الفريق سمو الشيخ سيف بن زايد النهيان نائب رئيس مجلس الوزراء وزير الداخلية سمو الشيوخ أصحاب المعالي والسعادة الضيوف الكرام السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته اسمحوا لي بداية بالتعريف عن نفسي معكم أختكم ذكرى السعيد الزعابي إخصائية أبحاث في مركز أبحاث الصحة العامة في جامعة نيويورك أبو ظبي يسعدني اليوم أن أتولى مهمة إدارة الحوار في هذا المجلس الموقر يستضيف مجلس محمد بن زايد الخبير لوشيان إنجلن الرئيس التنفيذي لترانسفورم هيلث وذلك لتقديم محاضرة بعنوان مستقبل الصحة رؤية شاملة للرعاية الصحية ستركز محاضرتنا اليوم على تأثير الصحة الاجتماعية في الأفراد وأهمية الأبحاث في الوقاية المبكرة وأود أن ألفت لعنايتكم الكريمة إلى أن المحاضرة ستكون باللغة الإنجليزية وبإمكانكم استخدام السماعات لمتابعة الترجمة الفورية واسمحوا لي الآن بأن أتحدث باللغة الإنجليزية Your Highnesses, Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen It is with great pleasure to welcome you all to Majlis Mohammed bin Zayed for the lecture titled Wellness in the Future, a Holistic Approach to Healthcare. This lecture aligns with the United Arab Emirates' ongoing efforts to advance the healthcare sector, emphasizing the importance of a collective society-wide approach to shaping the future of healthcare. I'm delighted to introduce today's keynote speaker, Lucian Englund, 
the Chief Executive Officer to Transform Health. With a distinguished career in acute healthcare, he continues to operate at the intersection of innovation and strategy, offering guidance on driving change and defining success through practical, actionable insights. Lucien, may I kindly ask you to begin your lecture? Thank you very much. Your Highnesses, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, and dear students. First of all, thank you for inviting me to share about, I think, a couple of opportunities at this moment in time that are very special, at least to me. As you can see in this graph, excuse me for that, what would happen if there would be a moment in time when we can lower the pressure on healthcare, that we can increase the economic return of every dollar spent in healthcare almost ninefold, and in the end create 4% economic growth. I hope at the end of my lecture, you can agree with me that we're at an interesting moment in time where these things might happen. A lot has happened since healthcare uh, originally was perceived and delivered in the homes of people. The physician would visit your home, the technology available back then would fit in his doctor's bag, and that was the way that we deliver healthcare. Since new technologies needed a bigger home, a bigger platform, needed a more centralized stage where we also brought the healthcare out of the homes of people back in the hospitals in other institutions. And now I think we're again at a different moment in time where technology presumes to bring a new wave of change, often stated in terms of what artificial intelligence can do, but we also need to be honest. Artificial intelligence is not going to solve everything. It can do a lot. Healthcare is all about human interaction, human connection. But what if in that human connection, one of two is no longer present? No longer present because the pressure on healthcare is staggering. In the Netherlands alone, we see a drop in the admission rate for people in nursing school for the third subsequent year of minus 20%. Over the past five years, that dropped 41%. And in many countries that I happen to be visiting is the same happening. Numbers of the UK, where we see also how clinicians, so the broader perspective, having this burden of falling in a burnout phase administrative burden of up to 40% is diminishing their joy and passion to deliver healthcare. So I think in healthcare, we're now facing what I like to call a plumber's problem. We wait until there's a problem, people come in, and with all the technology and all the knowledge and all the passion we have, we try to fix the holes in the wall. Meanwhile, at our shores of healthcare are being bombarded with extra pressure with burden also in terms of uh, financial uh, stress going into it. And if we look in terms of what drives health in the end of the day, we see interesting things. The drivers of health, as we like to call them, social determinants of health, we all know that 20% is based on your genetic profile. We still cannot do much about that. It's starting, of course. Then we have, where were you born? In the Netherlands, there's a city if you were born in that city, your life expectancy is 11 years less than the average Dutch citizen. This is the Netherlands, I think a well-developed country. Then we have behavior, the things you do, the things you don't, the things you eat, the things you don't eat, up to 40% determines your health. And then we got combination of all of those. This graph adds up to 100%. And there's one thing missing in that. Can you imagine what that is? It is, by the way, 6%. Healthcare contributes for 6% to your and my health. Interesting that 90% of our budget goes into that bucket. Whereas we know that 40% of our behavioral change drives a better health outcome, it only translates into less than 10%. And in the Netherlands, we have a new government, to be honest, even less, about 3% of our annual budget goes into the behavioral change. So my assertion is adding more healthcare 
is not going to solve us out of this crisis that's coming. Adding more health is. Somebody needs to go to the basement and close down the tap a bit more. Because in no way we will be able to handle a doubling of patients with almost 20% less in terms of professionals. And if we go on on this trajectory in 20 years from now, one third of this audience is no longer being able to have access to healthcare in the current way that we perceive. So my hope is that we also are trying to take a different stance in it. And I'm a big fan of personalized medicine. Big fan. I think the amount of progress being made at this moment is staggering. But I also hope that we will be able to create a new version, which is called personalized healthcare, which not only looks at the disease, but in the broader, more holistic perspective. And in the end, even personalized health. So you as a citizen can be helped based on your personal preferences, the ways well uh, uh, your, your body reflects on it. But we also need to be mindful that this is not a quick fix. So on this stage, already many experts have talked about personalized medicine, and there's a huge amount of great experts in Abu Dhabi and the UEA. So I would like to leave that for these um, uh, colleagues as well and step into the area of personalized healthcare and show you some examples of things that are happening in other places in the world. These are our self-measurement kiosks that we have in our hospital in Roermond in the Netherlands. We were the first hospital in Europe to utilize these apparatus. Every outpatient that visits our clinic steps into the system. Blood pressure is being measured, oxygenation level is being measured, your weight is being measured, and the data goes directly into the electronic medical record system. And I was hugely proud that we were the first hospital and then now it spread it across the country. But my question always was and will be, why in the world are we doing this in a hospital? Why not in the pharmacy, in an elderly home, or maybe even in the city hall? And I'm very glad that now one of the bigger changes of the pharmacists in the Netherlands has taken on that challenge and now is situating those apparatus in the pharmacies as well. And another example that also can help are digital humans. It's technology that I brought with me from Australia and New Zealand to the Netherlands that not only speaks 14 different languages, has emotional recognition, can see you, can hear you. And we've implemented that at the pharmacist in one of our hospitals where the pharmacist would be typically between four and five hours a day sitting on the phone explaining side effects to their patients, even while all the data sits on the website already. So now the patient push the space bar, asks about the medication and the side effects will be mentioned. The minute when the patient raises one of the eyebrows, it thinks, hmm, didn't get it. Decreases the level of complexity in the language model, repeats the same as well. And if you again raise your eyebrow, you will be dispatched to a real life pharmacist. This saves 20 hours a day in a pharmacy, just to give an example. And one of the other high level procedures, of course, in healthcare is blood drawing, phlebotomy. And I've been showing in my lectures since 2015, a small video where supposedly a autonomously robot will be able to draw your blood without any human intervention. And I was proud to, at a conference in Maastricht this year, on stage to demonstrate the very first robot that draws in 1.3 minute your blood and puts a patch on my arm without any human intervention. And the reason for showing this is that just imagine that this technology in five or in 10 years from now sits on your tabletop because we've seen what happened to our desktop with all the machines and all the information on it now sits in our phone and very soon in our glasses or in our lenses. And if you trust Elon Musk with a cable into your brains. So the progress is staggering. We will be able to measure things in different places and go from spot measurement to a continuously stream of measurement and be present before something happens. And when I brought this technology the patch to the Netherlands, we started to monitor our patients in our general wards, internal medicine and oncology. And we were able to predict 
two or three days earlier that a patient, when the patient will get discharged, and even in the morning that this patient will be needed to bring back, brought back to the ICU somewhere during the day. And we were proud to be able to do that. Meanwhile, the technology gets as small as fitting in our hands, or even a bit like an hearing aid that fits at the, at the back end of your phone. And the other part that's also interesting to see is that now science about this kicks in. We obviously have a huge amount of science about all the interventions that we've done for ages. And many argued that there was no science that backs up digital health. And that's coming up right now. And I actually think, looking into the things that we're doing, some of you might be young enough to remember the original Star Trek series. We laughed when somebody started to talk in a little black box. A communicator, they called it back then. But everything that happened in Star Trek back in those days, mid-70s, is now a reality. All but one, to be honest. Scotty, beam me up. Still not possible. Maybe that will come. We will have the opportunity to have labs sitting in our toilets, giving you advice about your nutrition, about your medication. And the shift here is that we'll go from a high acute setting being developed and innovated in hospitals, in university medical centers and industry towards more where the patient, the citizen is on a daily basis. And we also see the shift happening in the big corporates, whereas from the FDA approved, scientifically validated technology, they also want to go in this area of observational technology that brings in more data. But the other side, just to call it a bit the other side, big tech, uh, big tech also isn't sitting still. They also create technology that does exactly the same and they probably meet somewhere in the middle. One of these days, actually, to give you one example, there is going to be an update of the AirPods of one of the major technology companies that we might know. With that update, the AirPods are going to be an FDA approved official hearing aid, going to help thousands of people with technology that you buy in a store as opposed to in a medical field. So I think that going back to Star Trek, we're now entering the era of the medical tricorder, giving the ability to do so and also to collect all of that data. And we know that some of the tech companies are collecting all of that data recently at the health conference in Las Vegas, where I was to, uh, last week. Also, another big company announced that they also, in a different software platform, Android, will starting to do exactly the same. And combined with your great initiative, Shahatna, I think this gives an opportunity for many, many people also to learn about the things that matter to them and about their healthcare. And sometimes we think it takes time, and it does take time. But the speed that we see now is staggering. It's also increasingly, and it's increasingly exponentially, I think, and Ismail Salim also talked to you about that uh, lately as well, where the airline industry needed um, 70 years to reach 100 million people, Facebook has done the same in four years' time. And Instagram in two months. And Pokemon Go in three days. 100 million users in three days. Imagine if we would be able to use that technology to influence the behavior of our citizens and our patients. And I think we're near that. I think also the essence of how we are using data is changing. We tended to use data based on scientific literature. And now we have recent data, lab results from this morning, an MRI of yesterday. And we're now heading to that stream of continuously real-time data. And with it, also the essence changes from static data to now in this era, data that gives us the opportunity to predict things. The next phase is to prescribe things without a human intervention. So my career in healthcare started in ambulance services. And I think I will meet the day when somebody knocks at my door and I would open up and I see two former colleagues of mine. And I say, hey guys, what's up? And one of those would say, we're here for the cardiac arrest. And I would say, there's no cardiac arrest over here. And the other one looks at his iPad and he said, Lucian, take a seat. In 1.5 minutes, that is going to be the case. So we will be there 
at the moment in time when things happen as opposed to fixing that afterwards. But again, it also takes time. This is the Gartner hype cycle, a technological consultancy bureau that follows all kinds of technology, how things are going to be implemented and mainstream. Everything always starts with a hype. That's where all the major news outlets brag about these things and about how everything is going to be changed. Then we need legislation, payment systems, privacy, ethics. That's the drop that for innovators is the throw of disillusion. And then gradually, when things fixed, come into reality. Think solar panels. Think electrical vehicles. We all see that same pattern. It might be a bit broader or higher. The same also happens with technology. I was fortunate enough to be the first one in Europe to get one of the Google glasses of the inventor of it. And we started to utilize it on a trauma helicopter and, and streaming live from the accident, motor vehicle accident into the ER. Then another company came up with this big, huge apparatus, which is great, but all kinds of new technology. But at the health conference in Vegas again, Facebook announced new glasses that helps people that are visually impaired with AI to see what they cannot see because the lenses and the glasses see exactly what's happening and they can explain these things. And you can even ask somebody to come in and to see that together with you. But don't be fooled. I think the technology is the hype, but the change is the one that's, pers that's permanent. And that's also something that's difficult in the cultural change that you need also in, in professions and in highly educated surroundings as well. That's also the case for personal health. No, this is not a wrongly depicted Japanese flag. This is the one hour that a good friend of mine, a patient with Parkinson's, Sarah Rigare from Sweden, asserts in her PhD assertion, it's the one hour a year that she visits her neurologist. And she says, do you think that that one hour changes the other 8,765 hours of my life? I need more encounters for that. And we often like to tend to name that patient journeys. But many of the patient journeys are a journey of a patient in a institution at one ward. But the actual patient journey is the journey of life, as Annemiek Vroom of the Stichting, the Foundation Icona always states. And if we look at the process of healthcare as a patient, which I am myself as well, I think the majority of that, 80% from my patient journey, is blunt logistics, has nothing to do whatsoever with healthcare. I need to take a day off. Maybe even I need to somebody to go with me. I need to take a car to go to the hospital and these kind of things. So what I think that's needed is a Copernical moment. And Copernic was a scientist in the mid 1500s who proved that the sun was not circling the earth, but it's the other way around. And still the patient circles the professional in healthcare. But with this new phase that's coming up, I think we also have the opportunity to do it differently. Not or, or either or, but and, and. And that's also why, combined with the behavioral impact that we can make for in change of health, I ignited a program that's called Health Meets Retail. What if retail could step into the mix and help with all the technology as well to do things that we now do in healthcare institutions and lower the burden also for that? Only if it's validated, if it's credible, and if it's possible. And we started in the city center of Roermond in a pop-up store for six months. Roermond, every year 10 million people visit, it, visit Roermond. Not because it's a very beautiful city, which it is, by the way, but we've got one of the biggest designer outlet centers of Europe. And that's the reason why people come over to us. So we said, let's try this with technology and to see whether or not we could carve out 30% of the current procedures in healthcare that might be done, uh, be done also in a different place. And maybe even also in retail, they are doing already some of the things that we could combine with that. And we had research done in 15 countries at 16,000 consumers asking, would you be willing to use this? Guess what? The majority of the people say, yeah, sure. If I can get have a, have a quick appointment, 
if I can have my own results, and of course, if it's high quality. So this new paradigm that I'm seeing between healthcare at one end and retail at the other also brings consumerism. We now see more and more in our healthcare environments that people expect things in an instant because we live in this instant economy. If I order something today, I get grumpy if it's not being delivered by tomorrow. And healthcare still is a bit different. And then also when we start collaborating with retail gives us different opportunities, like the detaxation of healthy food. In the Netherlands and across Europe, healthy food is almost 40%, 40% more expensive than unhealthy food. So if you could remove the 21% tax in the Netherlands, just as an example, and getting more healthy food in front of people who are in need and can't afford that, imagine what happened. And sometimes we do fun stuff. We've created this little cart. And the assumption was, when I go shopping and I got this little device on it with my shopping list and my vital signs and stuff like that, the minute when I walk into the alley with candies, it would say, I don't think that that's a good idea. And maybe even if I could be a bit reluctant to put some power on that as well to make sure that I would skip the alley of candies. But also restrooms are getting remolded right now. They are going to be a wellness place in many places in the world where you've not only been accommodated in wellness terms, but also being measured in terms of not only vital signs, but also signs that can be measured and be utilized more often than only in the healthcare institutions. So combining all of those, real-time data, combined with my meal preferences in the middle, combined with the social determinants of health, I might get a different cash receipt than my son gets. Because combined with that, I get a personalized approach for that. And in the end, we will be present at the moment in time when somebody gets sick. And the great work of Machtelt Huber, who is a GP from the Netherlands, who created the Institute of Positive Health, created a framework that says, your health is not only your physical health, it's also your mental health, it's your social health, it's your financial health. People with a high financial debt are prone to use between 6 and 10% more healthcare. That model is now being disparsed in many countries in the world. And it also brought me to the notion of the old Boston paradox. And I think some of you might recall that from 2007, where Boston, top-notch medical technology, top-notch experts in the fields. A few miles from Boston, there was a huge inequality in terms of access for healthcare. And they perceived on that path to bridge those things uh, altogether. And also the Lancet Commission on Global Health 2035 states, if we would be able to invest in health in a different way, that could create up to an ROI of almost nine times the original investment. Just think about that. This also touches on the work of the employers in terms of improved productivity, longer time that people will stay at yours, reducing healthcare costs and the like. And in this study, a while ago, um, uh, David Bloom mentioned that every added year to a lifespan is going to add 4% economic growth. So for me, that kind of wraps it up. We got health and healthcare at one end, we got data and technology at the other, and we got economics. For me, that's bringing a new kind of formula, M times H is E. Medicine combined with health, the broader perspective, creates economic value. Again, not tomorrow. It will take a while. Just like also we've seen happening also in terms of cultural change needed from within, because the change in many industries comes from outside in, like digital photography. We know what happened with Kodak back in the days. Kodak was in the business of developing photos and film rolls. Then digital photography came, and then it came into our smartphones. And now for almost $200, you can buy a drone that takes every picture combined with AI. Interesting, however, is that the inventor of digital photography is an engineer of Kodak himself. And, we ha and when he went with this apparatus to his board, he was brushed off. You don't get our business model, was the answer. We are in the business of developing photos. And we all know what happened with Kodak. 
they come broke 12 years after. So every big change is about cultural change and, and accepting that change is the only permanent. And we always have to go through all of those. The thing I see now, however, I'm from a business family and I've learned early on that if somebody talks at a table about me and I'm not sitting at that table, I'm on the menu. And given the breadth of the healthcare industry, we're on the menu of many, many companies. That has not to be a bad thing, but we need to make sure that there's balances and checks in it. And the same goes also for AI. AI is going to build up on what we already do of have done on the internet. It's going to profoundly change everything that we do and that we can, but it will take time. And depending which study you trust, it is between seven and 17 years that change in healthcare becomes mainstream. And this digital transformation that we are right in right now is going to be making the world a lot smaller and to create a industry that's more like a software branch. And I think health is going the same trajectory. So what should we do? I think we should invite everybody to the table, not only IT people, not only medical professionals, not only nurses, not only students and policymakers, but also patients in formal care to make sure that we understand the real needs and jointly co-design, human-centered design, new opportunities to stretch the moment when we can influence the health of people as opposed to waiting till the end and then do everything that's possible. So combining all of those, I think we need to think different. All of these three buckets are absolutely important, but many of the de developments now in the homes of people regarding healthcare are being developed in the personalized medicine sphere, originally, of course. So we need to think different. I think healthcare is changing about four axes. First one being delocalized. We are going to deliver healthcare in different places, actually back in the homes of people. The second part is healthcare will become democratized. Citizens, patients will grant you a subscription to their data as opposed to we granting them access to our portal. And I think together with your Shahada uh, initiative, that's spot on. It's becoming digital. Society has become digital and health is going to become digital as well. And then it's also about big buckets of money, dollars. So join me. Join me into this new future where we don't have to travel to a different place or a different home. I think we need to enter a different room of our home that's big enough to invite everybody that's needed at the table. And combined with that, I think that in the end, medicine times health creates also economic prosperity. I wish you and all of us a soft landing into the future. Thank you. Thank you, Lucian, for that insightful lecture. The idea that health will become a software business reflects the growing integration of digital tools, data, technology, and healthcare. However, how can we ensure that the collection and utilization of personal health data adhere to privacy standards between healthcare providers and technology developers whilst fostering innovation? I think that needs a multi-layered approach. First of all, I think we need to be transparent about the things that we're doing. Uh, second of all, I also think that we need to address the benefits also for the citizens and patients for why we are doing that. I think we need to have an ethical framework, of course, by doing so. I always like to state we had crooks in the Middle Ages and we will have crooks in the future as well. So we need to safeguard that uh, as well. And we need to also incorporate this in the educational part, not only in medicine school or in nursing school, but actually in every level where we train students, uh, maybe even right from kindergarten, that this is not only the, let's say the new normal, but this is the way that we can be able that everybody has access to qualitative high care that's also affordable. 
In your presentation, you talked about the change curve and how we move from resistance to acceptance phase. How can we communicate to the public to build trust and promote engagement of these personalized health initiatives using smart technology? Again, a good question. Um, so the one thing I often see happening is that the way that we get this to the public is by official communication. And if we step out of this, um, this room, we also see that influencers on all kinds of social media are being able to influence youngsters, sometimes even in the wrong way, in terms of vaping and stuff like that. So why not also use those kind of tools, which for the majority of the generations that uh, uh, are coming up, are being utilized on a daily basis. So I think that's one. Second of all, give citizens access to their own data so they can see what's in there, so they can see if it's correct or to change that if needed or ask for change, and also to start utilizing that data for the better. It's a bit like in your car when somebody takes out the speedometer and as, says to you, you, you just don't drive about 100 miles an hour, just to give you an example. So we need those tools. And I think technology being brought in the broader perspective is now going to give us that opportunity. My last question to you, Lucien. To evaluate the impact and success of personalized health, health approach at a national level, what performance metrics or health indicators would be most relevant? Well, that's a research question, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I think first of all, the simple things like readmission rates in ER, um, because th something has gone wrong, uh, the adherence to new treatments, the adoption grade, how, sm how soon and how fast people are adopting these kind of things as well, but also the reduction of costs in that respect. While we also need to be mindful of there is an economic growth that will add costs to the healthcare aspect as well. So we also need to balance it for that. So from a research perspective, that's always a tricky question because how many does prevention deliver in the end of the day? Uh, so the KPIs, I think this is a new book that we need to write. We're in this together, but we're only at the start of that. And meanwhile, the goal is changing as well because technology gives us opportunities that we haven't had before. If I would have been invited a year ago to this place and I would start talking about what we now call chat GPT, everybody would say, would that be possible with the evolution, the revolution of it? So we need to bring in structures that are able to act fast on these aspects as well and then find KPIs that do, prevent, uh, that do present value into it. Thank you, Lucian, for this captivating discussion. In conclusion, prevention remains the best approach. Technology is crucial in helping the healthcare sector identify and avert health crises. This requires continuous investment in research and studies. I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to His Highness, Sheikh Saif bin Zayed Al Nahyan. I sincerely would like to thank Lucian England for his valuable lecture and I extend my gratitude to our esteemed audience for their kind presence. And now, I would like to invite your highness and the participants in today's video to join us on the stage for a group photo. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.